Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As you can see by your screen, today we are going to be talking about Fish and Wildlife's proposed new rule, which we propose to place at NJAC 7 colon 25-4A and be entitled to access restriction to tidal waters and adjacent shorelines for endangered species protection. My name is Mary Montesquio. I'm a regulatory officer with Fish and Wildlife. Also with me here today is Acting Chief Kathy Clark of the Endangered and Non-Game Species Program, Christina Cashy Davis, a principal zoologist, and Emily Heiser, an assistant biologist also with the Endangered and Non-Game Species Program. And I'm going to apologize in advance. Apparently allergy season has come to me, so um, if I sound awful, my apologies. So for um, anybody who at this point is unaccustomed to working with teams, we are muting everybody's mic for the entirety of the presentation. Afterwards, we want to hear from you. So we will be we will be opening the floor up to questions and comments and suggestions. Please raise your hand to ask a question or type it in the chat box. Raising your hand will put you in a queue based on the order of when your hand was raised. We're going to ask you to unmute yourself to ask your question, and please remember to mute again when you are finished and lower your hand. Again, we're here to talk about access restriction to tidal waters and adjacent shorelines for endangered species protection. The new rule will allow the DEP to restrict tidal waters and or the adjacent shoreline to protect threatened or endangered species of wildlife and their critical habitat areas. The public trust right to access the water was enacted in 2019 as PL 2019 Chapter 81 and codified at NJSA 13 1D 150 through 156. However, the legislature has acknowledged that the public trust doctrine has some limitations. The legislature recognized the department's ability to protect critical habitat areas from injurious uses or threatened or endangered species or their habitat areas from injury or injurious uses. And that language can be found at NJSA 13 colon 1D-155. In addition, the department is charged with protecting wildlife pursuant to the Endangered and Non-Game Species Conservation Act, known as ENSCA, which is at NJSA 23, 2A-1 through 13. Just a few important notes. First of all, we use endangered species and endangered and threatened species kind of interchangeably, but I want to make sure that I am clear and that when we use only the term endangered species, we are talking about the umbrella term to describe those species with the conservation status of endangered and those species with the conservation status of threatened. We will be doing future rulemaking to clarify the definitions and by cleaning up the lists that are currently at NJSAC 7 colon 25 4.13 and 4.17. In addition, we have two uh, definitions that we want to make sure that we note. First is adjacent shoreline, which shall mean that the, the land above the mean high watermark, including the upland dry sand or other upland ecosystem or biome as determined by the department. And critical habitat area, which shall mean the tidal waters or adjacent shoreline or bowl that are suitable for breeding, resting, or foraging by endangered species and are essential to the conservation of the species, thereby warranting special management considerations or protection. I'm going to turn over the next couple of slides to Acting Chief Kathy Clark for her descriptions. Kathy? Yeah, hi. So, um... There's a lot of text in this presentation. Here are some photos. Uh, these are examples of critical habitat for endangered species in shoreline areas. And I'll just uh, review them briefly. The upper left is a 
typical Delaware Bay Beach during the spring migration in May when uh, uh, a number of species of shorebirds uh, concentrate on Delaware Bay beaches for foraging and resting. Uh, the upper right is a picture of a black skimmer colony. Uh, they are colonial nesters um, that, that use mostly Atlantic coast beaches, shoreline. Uh, lower left, piping plovers, of course, nest individually uh, on mostly Atlantic, um, but sometimes Delaware Bay beaches. Um, and then there's a least tern, uh, also a colonial nester. They nest in groups uh, in on Atlantic beaches. And uh, lower right, um, we actually are starting to see the occasional sea turtle nest uh, in New Jersey. Uh, beaches. And the next slide shows examples of uh, some injurious uses uh, that affect critical habitat for endangered species or affect the species directly. And um, I think we've all seen examples of these, but this is uh, some of the heavy shoreline use that we get during the summer. Summer, of course, coinciding with the breeding season. Uh, boat landings, uh, personal watercraft, heavy use of the shoreline. Um, the lower left shows even walking um, that can cause birds to flush and whether they're breeding or uh, foraging or resting, um, those continuous flushes are um, fall in the category of injurious uses. Uh, unleashed dogs uh, can be a problem, especially around breeding colonies. And the lower right um, shows uh, kind of the heavy trampling that occurs on uh, on heavily used um, recreational beaches. And you know you can see the contrast with a fenced off area that is a, a nesting area. Thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> So again, these restrictions will apply to tidal waters and or the adjacent shoreline to protect threatened or endangered species of wildlife and or their critical habitat areas. Examples of the restrictions include seasonal closures of selected beaches to protect migrating shorebirds, such as red dots, and beach nesting birds that forage and rest in the intertidal zone, and seasonally fenced beach areas to protect endangered birds, such as the piping plover or sea turtles nesting on the beach. This management has been in practice for 20 plus years under beach management plans and some CAFRA permits. <coughs> we have decided to put in a process and the process includes that the department would determine whether a restriction is required by confirming that three specific conditions are present at a site. Number one, the department must document that an endangered species is presently using or is anticipated to use tidal waters and or the adjacent shoreline. Number two, the tidal waters and or adjacent shoreline must be demonstrated to be a critical habitat area for the species. And number three, the department must find that existing or anticipated injurious uses would result in harm which is a form of take prohibited under the Endangered and Non-Game Species Conservation Act. If the department determines a restriction is required, it will determine the extent of the area and the time frame for the restriction to be in place. The department will designate the minimal area and duration necessary to protect the species or the critical habitat area. Restrictions may reoccur as needed annually, span multiple years, or start and end multiple times within a year or across multiple years. The department will provide advance notice of all restrictions. It intends to implement by U.S. mail return receipt requested or by email if preferred to the affected landowner and the respective municipality. Property owners will be notified at least 30 days prior to the implementation of restriction allowing time for the landowner to contact the department with questions or concerns. There will be exceptions. Exceptions to the 30-day notice may occur if there is an urgent need for a restriction 
or if the need for the restriction was not anticipated. In those cases, notice will be made as soon as all affected property owners can be identified and contacted. Public notice will also be made. It will be made via postings on the department's website. Restrictions that are seasonally implemented by the department will remain in effect each year without additional notice until formally revoked. Sure restrictions that are intended to reoccur annually will be described that way, such as Delaware Bay beach closures for migrating shorebirds each spring. Any such multi-year restrictions will be reviewed annually by DEP staff to ensure they meet the three required conditions. The department will post signs, stakes, or flags and or fencing or ropes to mark restricted areas to the extent practicable to notify the public physically and visually of a restricted area. We are also proposing penalties in this rule. The department is proposing a minimum fine of $250 for entering a restricted area and $50 for damage to or removal of the state's property, such as the fencing and the signage. Penalties may be up to $25,000 for those who enter a restricted area and up to $1,500 for those who cause significant damage or remove the state's property, especially where cost of replacing the item would exceed a nominal amount. For those of you who know ENSCA, this is um, the range within that law, and it is a range within which a judge decides what the penalty will be. We are also including stays and appeals. Affected landowners may apply to the department for a stay. Affected landowners may appeal a restriction. Both the stay language and appeals language are anticipated to mimic DEP regulations already in place, such as the land use regulations. What's our timeline? The department will propose this new rule in early 2024. Notice of the rule proposal will be posted on the DEP website at www.nj.gov slash DEP slash rules with instructions on how to provide comments. Those who have received a direct email notice to this webinar will receive an email notice of the rule proposal when it's published. To be added to the Shore Protection Rule email notice list, please email nongame at DEP Dot nj dot gov with that request. Also at that same email box, please email comments, questions, and suggestions. Please use shore protection in the subject line. But of course, that is after we are done here today because we now want to know what you all think. So we are going to open the floor for any questions, comments, or suggestions. Uh, I have a question, but I'm only on the phone. I don't know if you're only taking questions from the web or from the phone. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have two questions. One, <clears throat> what is different with this rule versus what you've done before? Because I know I've seen beaches roped off, uh, telling people not to go because of the nesting birds and all. So I'm not sure what's what is different that's being proposed? And two, does this also affect the waters outside of the beaches, or is this just a rule for closing beaches? That's it. Well, I can take the first part. Um, so the majority of the beach restrictions that have been put in place have been put in place because of a permit or because of uh, CAFRA or a beach management plan. Um, this is a little different in that um, those are on the other side of the department under the land use um, or the land resource protection area. This is the first fish and wildlife law uh, regulation where we are going to be closing or restricting areas that may have in the past not had a permit or do not have a beach management plan or some other mechanism whereby Fish and Wildlife would get in the door through that 
permit or uh, management plan. So it's a little different for us, certainly. This is, this is our first rule in this area. And I don't know, Kathy, if you wanted to answer the second part. Um, right, so this applies to the intertidal portion of the beach as well. And um, uh, that's one of the things um, that is it, so one of the things in the draft rule now is is that it's intertidal um, and we haven't uh, I'm not sure we've defined a subtitle um, so uh, but of course it it would be um, limited to the title range um, and uh, you know, maximum, um, it would be state waters, um, which is three miles offshore. But of course, the intent is really about um, the the portion that is important to endangered species, which is the uh, intertidal zone between um, uh, the uh, lowest low tide and highest high tide. Um, See a the second hand is Ned Gain. Thank you. Am I coming in clearly? Yes. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first question is: um, Are the critical habitats listed on the DI the DEP's GIS website um, so that we could sort of look at some of the areas that are listed as critical habitats? Um, it, no, they, uh, they're not critical habitat in the same sense that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service defines it. Uh, they're, they're critical habitat areas, um, which for those of you, uh, in, in the coastal municipalities, you know that sometimes, uh, the areas that are used by endangered species can shift from year to year. Um, we refer to the critical wildlife habitat areas as those that uh, uh, are occupied by endangered species or um, or likely to be occupied. Um, and as, as many of you know, a lot of the uh, protected areas are the same from year to year, uh, but they can shift because uh, some sometimes you know the birds shift and and we respond to that. So it's not um, you know. The critical habitat area is an element of uh, of the three elements that have to be present for the department to uh, to use this uh, area restriction. So my my question specifically is to the GIS. So um, you know the DEP has a lot of these GIS programs that have maps and overlays where you can see you know uh, where areas are with whatever you're highlighting for that reason, be it tide lands or or permits or something. You can look over and see this on a on a GIS map. Is there a way to see this this program or this sort of affected areas by this proposed rule to be on a GIS program? Um, well, as uh, Mary reviewed in the process that um, we we are going to give notice and when we give notice it, it will there will be a map. Um, there will be a location. So. Um, so I think I think the answer here is that we're going to take your comment into consideration on mm -hmm. how to provide that. Very good. And the second question is. Um, are there considerations for uh, the title, the title cycle? So, you know, if we're dealing with shorebirds, the shorebirds being not really a care when the tide is in the flood condition for certain areas, like you were saying, intertidal. So when, when the water's flooded, um, do the ease, do, is there an easement for public use of those flooded areas? Like, are we mapping the entire region, including in flood stage as well as in low tide stage? Or are we doing it for just during a tidal cycle? Um, I don't know, uh, Kashi, do you, if you want to step in on that, but I think the answer is that we are responding to um, where the uh, where the endangered species, uh, the portion of the beach that are that's going to be used by the endangered species. 
um, the the um, flood tides um, are are one of the things that actually you know can wreck a bird colony, a bird nesting colony. Um, so, so I, I'm I'm being specific to the Cape Shore region where I have my oyster farm. Um, oh, okay. Right. So in general, I was trying to be broad in my question, but it's a very specific area. So I'm, I can be very specific. You know, we egress and, and uh, we come in and out during an area. It's, it's just adjacent to where we have markings that have been there for, you know, as long as I've been there over two decades. So, you know, they've been closed. We have a little spot we can go to, but, you know, we're not there. We, you know, we try to interact as much as possible. But then as when the tide comes in, that whole area floods, the shorebirds are confined to a very small, narrow area. Um, I'm sure that's the area of focus for this listing and not the areas that are under the underwater now. Yeah, I, th I think the answer to that is is yes. And what we're looking at, um, and, and if you're in Delaware Bay Shore, um, you know that the areas that we have um, tried to protect for the last 20 years, and, and those aren't really going to change unless the birds show us that that they need a different area. Um, so so this is really, for the most part, it's more of the same of what we've already been doing for 20 years. Um, and we're not looking to, you know, really expand um, uh, in, into new areas, um, you know, uh, unless there's, you know, very particular circumstances. Um, Final final question, is there going to be an enforcement component to this? Like, is there going to be a way to help? You know, it's great to have rules, but it's also wonderful when those rules are enforced because then they actually yeah. do stuff. So like, um, is there an enforcement component to this as well? There isn't, and that's the real, that's the thing that's always been missing um, in, in a lot of the protection, protected areas that we've established. Um, and this, this does uh, allow for enforcement. And it's not, you know, it's not something abstract like, um, you know, it, it, it measuring harm. It, it's really just setting up. Once we set up, uh, you know, provide notice and set up uh, these, re, you know, these fenced areas or signed areas, then it's just basic uh, enforcement of the signed areas. Thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. Thank you. Um, uh, Kath, I th oh, sorry, go ahead. I think the first person who asked questions was on the phone and had wasn't the hand raised, so I think Douglas hasn't had a chance yet. Oh, sorry. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. How is the um, how is private property being handled in this equation? privately owned property from a citizen. We are not anticipating a difference between publicly owned lands and privately owned lands. Can you repeat that again, please? We are not anticipating a difference between publicly owned lands and privately owned lands when it comes to the regulations. Now, I don't know, Kashi or Kathy or Emily, if you want to address that, because I believe um, you have some private lands that you already closed and how you've handled those in the past. Um, for the Atlantic Coast beaches, that are the ones I'm most familiar with for beach nesting birds, uh, what we've done in the past is they are sometimes folded in to the beach management plan, so they're covered that way. Or if it's a private landowner who doesn't have a beach management plan or otherwise um, a CAFR permit in any way, then we work closely with that landowner. Um, our goal, as always, is to build relationships with our landowners and not, you know, force protections onto them. Um, it's always the goal is to get everybody on the same page and protect the birds as best we can, and that will continue with this new regulation. Um, I'll be specific. I own property on uh, Reeds Beach on North Beach Avenue um, that my, it's been in my family since the early 70s. And uh, we used to be have a really good partnership from, from you know, when I was a little kid working with um, everyone who was there to tag birds uh, traveling um, and landing. And I feel it's become much more adversarial over the years. And I'm trying to uh, repair that relationship 
and try and find out what the best way is for everyone to use um, property that I'm paying for. Well, I think I can jump in here and just say, um, if you could send an email to this non-game email address and, and give yes. us some specifics about the property, I'm sure we'll be more than happy to reach out to you and have a conversation. Will do. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, now I'm not sure who's next. Is it Ken? I think Ken. Yeah. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I have some of the similar concerns that Doug had uh, about private property. Um, I'm on this meeting wearing two hats. I am the mayor of Marshall Township, but I'm also the chairman of the Delaware Bayshore Council. So with the uh, chair of the Delaware Bayshore Council, you know, I represent uh, from the Delaware Memorial Bridge down to the Cape May Canal, the shore communities. Um, so uh the private property part is a concern for for my constituents um for fishing purposes or whatever it may be if the dep comes in to decide and decides to close a, a piece of i'm going to say private beach but the upland area is private and they walk down to the beach so they don't have there's no public access anymore um and and i i agree with doug on the adversarial part of it uh case in point with the normal closings of the uh, the May area uh, uh, this year, the DEP closed some of the areas in Marsh River Township that uh, we actually have an ordinance that was passed in 2015 uh, that states certain areas will be left open. Uh, there was no communication from the DEP whatsoever. However, I've got quite a few, uh, you know, unhappy constituents who who phoned the town hall and phoned my phone asking what the heck is going on uh and the dp was unresponsive to any requests so i have concerns of any kind of uh new rules going forward that this is only going to get worse and not better um well i'm sorry about that um and I think I think this actually is the road to getting better um, because there's a, this includes a process uh, of notification. So uh, um, now there are so so I think the I think what we've built in is a, a 30 day uh, notice. So the notice is about um, planned closed areas uh, will be on the website and. Um, as we said, anyone who, um, you know, I, I think we will do our best to reach out to any municipality or private property owner um, uh, about a specific closure that's being proposed. And that 30 day notice period is in order to have those conversations ahead of time. Uh, there, there are the times that, you know, we anticipate uh, there's going to be um, not there won't be enough time for that notice because you know piping plovers set up nesting um on and and we just have to respond to it but um for the the delaware bay um uh beaches and that and that closure you know closures during may a lot of those are predictable um i i, I think i might know what you're talking about what happened in in last may um, which was more of a, you know, late term response on our part on our part. But this rule is going to build in that process uh, and, and hopefully set up better communications with landowners and any munis municipalities. So so one last thing, um, you know, fisher uh, fishermen are one of my big concerns. Uh, as you're well aware, along the Delaware Bay Shore, we don't have the option like along the Atlantic Coast to, if you close a section of the beach on the Atlantic Coast, you close a couple hundred yards, you can just move down a few hundred blocks and still fish. That's not the case along the Delaware Bay Shore. There's specific areas where you have access to surf fish. So, and obviously they're the same places that the birds will want to nest. So you can't really compare the Delaware Bay Shore to the Atlantic Coast. Yeah, um, 
you know, as Mary said, we would like to hear more of those details. You know, if, if you want to email us, um, that'll help. That'll help us as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, Michael? Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, Mike from Ocean City. Um, so you're not going to publish a beach list with your proposed rule uh, addition? Is that is that true? If um, I understand the yeah. question, yes. So the well, the proposal is not specific, but and the way that we're planning on noticing people is really through email, U.S. mail, return receipt requested or through the department's website. Yeah, but the question is, so when you are looking for comments next year, there's not going to be a list of beaches that you've already established that, that are going to be closed? Oh, I don't know. Kathy, Kashi, what are you thinking about for the future? Well, um, I mean, Kashi can jump in uh, if she wants, but we... I think, um, you know, as, as soon as once once this rule is in place, uh, there is a process that that we are going to stick to for notifying. And um, uh, I, I'm not sure there will be simply a list of beaches, but I think there will be uh, identification of um, shoreline areas um, that is specific to say, you know, the streets at the beach. Um, and most of these are going to be areas that have a long tradition of being fenced uh, for for nesting uh, and and migrating birds. Kashi, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of agree with what the lot tail part of what you said and just, you know, for Mike, who's a great partner. Hi, Mike that it doing? will not really feel very different um, for you. It's going to be very much following, continuing to follow the beach management plans. Um, the rule does give us the opportunity and ability to restrict intertidal zones, which was something new that the beach management plans don't currently have. But we also don't anticipate doing that in a, you know, every single beach we're closing the intertidal. There's a lot of practical considerations that as our partners will all take into account to try to determine. So it, for the Atlantic Coast folks, um, a lot of this is going to be what your beach management plan says is what we'll continue to do, as well as what you've seen in the past. Um, you know, so Ocean City is a great example. North End is a protected zone. We pre-fenced that because we know those birds will be back. That's what happened this year. And then right in the center of town, we had that surprise pair. So we put up some fencing for them. If you recall, it was actually two pairs in the beginning that were in that stretch from kind of that 15th to 17th and then in the 20s. The 15th and 17th pair stuck, so we continued on with management there. The 20th pair went off to greener pastures. We pulled that fence down and, and any of those restrictions were lifted. So it will be following a lot of that similar pattern that you're already used to. Uh, well, I'm glad you brought that up because my next question is, once the symbolic fencing goes up and the birds are there, does that mean that the beaches above the high tide line will then be closed? So in other no. words, in the middle. No, that's an important thing for people to understand. We, we've we been trying to bullet it, and I, I recognize it's difficult um, to conceptualize because the wording of it sounds uh, very dramatic, that the whole beach is closed. That's not what we're anticipating. The adjacent shoreline, again, for the Atlantic coast side, for the nesting birds, will continue to be what you're used to. The area is fenced off for the nesting habitat, and then the potential for restricting intertidal zone access if we think it's something that can help the birds, that meets the criteria, that we're working with our landowners, um, but this is not this is not something you need to worry. That 16th Street is totally closed now. To the public that's not what the rule is um, is trying to accomplish. Okay, I'm glad you clarified that. And my last question is, who's going to do the enforcement? That would be us. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have law enforcement at Fish and Wildlife, and um, yeah, they're spread thin. That's okay. about all I can say on that subject. Uh, that sounds good to me. But it is very similar to what we do now. You know, when we have something um, 
that is a big issue, which we do occasionally get extreme vandalism where people are, are ripping down a lot of our equipment um, or that we have somebody who is very difficult for our staff to just kind of working through education and outreach is not working, that we already do have the ability to call our enforcement officers and they are able to respond in those really, you know, difficult situations. And this just gives them um, a, a little bit more of a black and white line of understanding where the the issue or the problem is. Um, so if there is a situation where people um, should be ticketed, it will make it a little bit easier for the enforcement officers to do that. But yes, they're very spread thin, but I also do wanna give props to our enforcement officers. They do a great job when they are able to, to help us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, um, Catherine. Hi, um, I'm from uh, Cape May Point, um, and I'm the commissioner for uh, public lands. And our beach management plan is actually um, being developed uh, for an update. Uh, previously, we had one specific beach set aside for a certain period of time um, that is heavily used for fishing and other things. Uh, I'm not aware of whether any birds have ever nested there. And I think your answer to the previous speaker answered some of what I was going to ask, which is if, you, if you're a town with a beach management plan, this doesn't necessarily change things much from what you're already doing, though you might, depending on the bird, needs expand some of the area that's protected yeah that's so. right Catherine so for plans that are being developed now or for ones that are up for you know their renewals um the inner tidal zone area will also be able to be um dealt with in the plans if if the town and the negotiation with the service and us and everything so chooses that will be something that would be different than the way the previous beach management plans were done. But largely it's gonna be very similar to what the, the previous plans were, which is as you're indicating, there may be protected precautionary recreational zones, areas that are fenced for the nesting, but this isn't, oh, the whole beach is closed. That's not what, um, right. that's not what this okay. is. And uh, I believe it's not your department that's developing this plan. I think it's the federal partner. Yes, it's you, it's led by the, the field office of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they have right. some contractors that help. But Emily and I are also involved in that process. We just technically don't do the actual meetings with you guys, but we sure. do a lot of the review that okay. when, when you guys are going back and forth and the final plan we sign off on as well. Yeah, so I know you're familiar with the temporary nesting site we had at one of our other beaches, which we thought perhaps was because it was during the time beaches were closed during COVID. And mm -hmm. it was the first time we had oyster catchers build a nest right there. But we And it was roped off, but um, there was a lot of usage of that beach, which probably may have contributed. It was probably predator issues. Um, Anyway, I look forward to the process with the beach management plan and whether or not there's going to be any changes. I'm not certain how the original beach was chosen for precautionary. And there's been a lot of changes in the beaches since that was originally developed. So, yeah, so that's what's great about so that process is you'll have the ability to, to speak with the service and their contractors and with us, you know, you can always reach out to Emily and I sure. as well. Yeah. Um, and we try to, you know, come up with plans that will make it, you know, kind of quote as painless as possible for the landowner, but also make sure we're taking consideration the needs of the birds. And I think that largely the yeah. plans do a really good job of that, of working with our partners and and trying to come to some common ground. Yeah, I imagine they do. And I think the plan we have was fine. Uh, and we have some beaches that are highly used and some that are less used. So that also may have an impact on what the birds choose. But um, yeah. Uh, I understand from what you're saying, you're ex you're now taking on the authority to extend beyond the current permitted or beach management plan areas. So for towns like ours, this doesn't change things a lot. No. Okay, good to know. Thank you.
Anyone else have any questions, comments? Um, as we said, you can voice them here um, and we can have a chat or um, uh, you're free to uh, email us. And we are recording this uh, webinar, so uh, this could be uh, something that if you need to forward to others who couldn't be here today. Um, will s the slides be available? Um, yeah, I think that's part of the recording. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Um, I have a feeling that the folks that we emailed about today's presentation um, probably forwarded to others. So it, anyone who wants uh, to get the recording or any other news, please do sign up on our email address list uh, so that we make sure we can stay in touch with you about this. Hey, Kath, I'm wondering if Lenore also meant if the like PDF of the slides would be available so people could flip through on their own timeline. Uh, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, so I'm thinking too, we could probably put that somewhere. Sure. Uh, yes, I see a hand. Am I unmiked? Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, in the um, Dalhaven area of the beach, there are two roads that go to the beach, both of which were completely closed off in prior years. Why was that? Now, you can say that one of them, uh, Millman Avenue, wasn't closed off. But what was closed off was the access to the beach. You could climb over the bulkhead and over the rock pile and get to the beach. That's very dangerous for anybody and people come down with their kids. The area of Del Haven had no access to the beach. You guys closed it off. You need to open up some access to the beach there for these people to use the beach. All right, well, we'll, we'll look at that. Um... Uh, as I said, next uh, prior to next May, um, we will. We need to look at that because uh, Roosevelt be... Avenue was the same way. You blocked off the only access there, and these are the only two roads in Del Haven. And the entire community of Del Haven and Green Creek lost all access to the beach. Period. That's not proper. Now, the next question that I have had to do with the law. How do you intend to get over the? Um, the, the word in the um, in the uh, first uh, law of the public trust doctrine, that's 13.1D-150, that's where it says the public has longstanding and inviolatable rights to access the beach. How do you intend to get over that word inviolatable? Well, as we said, let me get back to the slide. The legislature acknowledged that there are limitations to the public trust doctrine when they passed NJSA 13 colon 1D-155, which recognized the ability to protect critical habitat areas and injurious uses or threatened or endangered species or their habitat areas from injury or injurious uses. All part uh, of that oh, same oh, don't, law. Don't stop there. There's more to that law, but only to the extent necessary. You have to show that it's necessary to close yep. off the entire beach. We will show that it's necessary when we do our our restrictions. That is where those three criteria come in. That we have to show there is an endangered species present or yes. anticipated to use. Yes, and that it's critical habitat and that injury would result. Yes, ma'am, I understand that. But necessary doesn't mean they actually use it. Is it necessary for them to use it is the question. Not that they actually use it, because these birds land everywhere in the world, and you could close off every part of the beach everywhere. But necessary is the important word there. 
how do you propose that it's necessary for this bird to land on that section of beach when his entire coast of the United States is available to a red knot or turnstone and all these other birds? Entire coast is available to them. Why is it necessary to do it right here? That's the question I'm asking. And well, biologists, biologists, you want to take a stab at how you anticipate use? Yeah, please do. Well, we have um, we have almost 40 years of surveys that show that red knots um, use Delaware Bay and they use it to the exclusion of many other habitats. And and the reason, of course, is the horseshoe crab uh, spawning yeah. there. The horseshoe crab spawning. Uh, provides a, a food that is um, unmatched uh, anywhere else. So it is necessary for red knots and other shorebirds to use Delaware Bay beaches. Necessary would imply that there's no other alternative. All Correct. other alternatives are, are, are up, available up and down the entire coast. In fact, you got documentation from Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, that they land there and eat things there. You have all that documentation available to you. Necessary means they do. The means that these things are not available to them. And well, the necessary in, in this case means that they that they uh, do rely on Delaware Bay uh, more than any other site, which is true. That doesn't. That's not what necessary means. I'm asking you how you're going to overcome that hurdle in law, which says only to the extent necessary when you can't show that it's actually necessary. It's useful, yes, but not necessary. Well, there's actually, I, I think there's I think there's 40 years of, of survey and research oh. that would show that Delaware Bay is absolutely necessary to shorebirds. Excuse, excuse me. There's a guy named McGowan. Um, I forget his first name. U.S. Geological Service did a, did a, did a research paper on that on the survival rate of these birds, the heavy ones leaving the bay versus the light ones, and the difference is 0 0.003 percent difference, which is insignificant in in this study. Now that doesn't show that the bird has to eat here. Well, anyhow, that's my question: How do you get over inviolable, and how do you get over necessary? Thank you very much. Things we will consider. You're welcome. Did I see one more hand? Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that for me? Uh, Doug, Douglas, yes. Yeah, I want to circle back if I could please and discuss about private property. Mm -hmm. um, my father uh, passed a couple of years ago and his uh, and I've inherited the house along with my two brothers and my stepmother. And my father has always been the point of contact for um, DEP related issues. I'll forward all my um, family's contact information to that email that you sent me. However, one of the things that my father was told in the past was because our property literally is on the beach and backs up to um, potential areas uh, of the beach that we were told that we can't even be on our decks um, in the in the May landing area, is that accurate? Um, I don't know. I don't see us uh, trying to restrict uh, use of um, of of a house or deck. The intertidal zone is is the intertidal zone. Uh, I would not I would not um, extend that to your house. What if a house overhangs the intertidal zone? Yeah, I I mean, I I guess that's arguable. That is certainly not uh, not the intent here. Because that wasn't the it, there was expressed that if it was um, if we didn't stay off the deck, they were going to basically say we can't occupy the house. And I wanted to know how the DEP is going to compensate people who are not able to occupy a house. Yeah, uh, like I said, that's that's not the intent here. Um, the the intent is uh, any it, things that would uh, preclude um, uh, endangered species from uh, use of the tidal areas. You know, I I've worked on on Reed's Beach, and I know that um, a lot of the houses uh, are, are are right next to or over the intertidal zone. 
um, use of the houses does not really preclude birds from using the intertidal uh, sand. I, I was trying to make the same argument. That wasn't the argument that was given to my father. Unfortunately, he's not here to discuss that point, but I want to make sure that that's not what you're considering. Um, and no, the, I, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, um, you know, when you're there, it's different when you're walking along the beach um, and and that tends to move birds off as opposed to um, uh, other activities that are not on the beach per se. I mean, yeah, there there could be, uh, you know, some effect of people uh, that are on a deck that is right over the intertidal, but um, that's that's not really, you know, what we're talking about in, uh, with this rule. There are limited properties on Reeds Beach um, where people are typically down in the water uh, for any kind of extended period of time. How does the DEP justify that as a quote unquote take or damage or, 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 da or in any way affecting the birds if they have to fly 100 feet further when they flew from Costa Rica, let's say, to land on the beach? Well, one of the important things to consider um, with the migratory shorebirds is that they're, they're here for a very short period. Um, they need to feed nearly constantly uh, in order to leave, um, leave Delaware Bay and get to the Arctic in, uh, in good condition for breeding. So kind of anything that interferes with their ability to feed and rest um, uh, it, it is, is an issue for them. And, and take includes um, a, a rather wide definition that includes harm and harass. So uh, things, so any other thing to consider is that um, all of these effects add up. And so being pushed from one property, um, you know, that, that may happen to them all day long. Uh, and that means that they go, um, they go, they could go days uh, without doing their maximum feeding and instead they're using up calories to escape people. And, and that's typical and things have, have just gotten worse uh, in, in New Jersey over time with, um, you know, increased, you uh, uh, beach recreation, increased uh, development along the shoreline. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges. Um, and and where we're going with this is um, is mainly to uh, uh, try to uh, set up a better process for um, being able to predictably um, restrict some some beach access where it's necessary. And um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, um, and, and make it enforceable. Um, so we're not really trying to, to change um, the things that we have been doing for endangered species over the last uh, 20 plus years, uh, but this will make it enforceable. Sure. Uh, I mean, for example, if you look at your map of Reeds Beach, you have Block 18, Lot 30, which is a large swath of area which is the primary point where I've spent my entire life helping the NJDEP um, tag birds and ban birds up until 15 or 20 years ago where they said we're not welcome to be part of that, that group anymore as volunteers. Um, and now you are steadily moving from that block and lot down capturing other additional properties that are, that are personally owned and limiting access to the water there. And I have great concerns that we're, as we keep expanding under the umbrella of uh, we can't allow any harm to happen to the shorebirds, we, we neglect the fact that there's harm happening to the property owners through the, the inability to use their properties at their discretion for which they're paying taxes uh, to the state of New Jersey. And that includes if I were to rent said property on weeks or even the month of May for argument's sake, and then you restrict the use of the property, there is no consideration how that affects um, any income or mitigate mitigation of property uses. There's, there's no mm -hmm. feedback to, to the property owners. 
Um, well, well I actually hope. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you said feedback, and I thought communication, and and I, I think that this um, has the potential to greatly improve communications, uh, especially with the private landowners, and um, um, you know that is it, there are some really important habitats, and and birds. You've probably seen birds shift um, over the years, uh, even across uh, Reeds Beach. So, you know, we try to respond to that. But I, I think uh, the process that this is going to set up is going to really help uh, those communications. And, and we do welcome uh, your individual questions um, and individual issues there. Yeah, I, again, I wear two hats also, at least two hats, because I'm also the public works superintendent for North Wildwood. And okay. I have a, a good working relationship with um, with all of your department um, as far as my professional side of things. It's where my personal side dealing with my own property where I feel the communication needs to be much better than it currently is. Um, and, and again, I need to think there needs to be a little give and take, not just take. Thank you. I hear you. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll forward my information to the uh, the website that's up there um and uh we can discuss in much greater uh detail at a later time thank you for thank your time. you yeah thanks uh i see one hand um we are running uh we're running up against our hour um and i i know some people have to leave but uh so i'll give you one minute <laughs> Are you talking to me? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Are you uh, old fisherman? Yes. This man raises two points. One, rent of a of beachfront properties. That happens in Delhaven also. I had one person down there tell me, I just rented that house now. He said, tell me I can't go on the beach. That's why I rented the house. So you're affecting a whole section there of rentable properties in that one block section that, that actually intersects the beach. The second thing, um, Kathy, what you mentioned is that these birds uh, need to fatten up in order to breed. I would like you to give me uh, give make available some study that shows that that's true, because the only study we have is the McGowan study is about survival, not breeding. So do they need to wait for breeding? Show me a study that says that's true, please. That's all I have to say. Okay, um, well, there is such information, um, but we we are, a, um, yeah, we can, uh, we can talk by email, but um, we are up against our one o'clock and I know some of our yeah. people have yeah, to so leave. There may be that information, but I have never been able to find it on the internet anywhere. Well, yeah. you know, not, not everything is available on the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the studies that I'm familiar with uh, is birds um, with transmitters uh, and some lower weight birds actually don't always make it to the Arctic and they don't breed uh, in some cases when they're there. So uh, so there's definitely a connection to the bird condition when they of leave course, Delaware Bay. According to McGowan, the d difference in survival between light and heavy birds and survival is defined by the bird was seen again in some subsequent year as when it was tagged. Its survival rates are about the same. So yes, there are deaths okay. of birds. Well, that's, that's, that's one study and I think there's a lot more. Um, I'd like to see them, thank you, I'm out. Okay, all right, um, so Thanks, everyone. Please uh, do write down nongame at dep.nj.gov. Um, that's the mailbox we're going to use for uh, comments and questions. And uh, certainly, if you want to remain um, uh, in touch via any email announcements, uh, send your email to that one. OK. Thanks, everybody. Are, are we good? Yep. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.